Well, welcome everyone to DigiTIF 53. Uh, today we're delighted to be joined by Marissa Gilberg from Remote Work Prep. Uh, Marissa has a newsletter called Remotely Interesting and she does lots and lots of thinking on remote work and the benefits of remote work and how you should approach it correctly. So loads and loads of insights for us today. Um, I think she'll just be kicking off with um, some of her perspective and then once she's kind of introduced the topic, we'll have a lot of time for a QA and a because I'm sure that all of us are still making sense of remote work and how we can make it work in our organisation. So it's a really interesting discussion to be having today. So Marissa, over to you and welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, John. Hi, everyone. Um, please excuse my voice if it's a little crackly. It's it's morning here, but um, so nice to meet you all. My name is Marissa Goldberg. I am the founder of Remote Work Prep. I started working remotely in 2015, so about seven excuse me, seven years ago now. And my background is actually in software engineering and product management. So I was working at an in-person tech job. And honestly, I was struggling because there was a lot of harassment and it wasn't a healthy work environment. It was very toxic. So I considered leaving tech entirely, but I thought, oh, I'll take one more job in the tech world, see whether it still matches this um, toxic experience. The role that I took happened to be remote and I fell in love with it like I had control over my environment. Um, I could do the things I wanted to do. I could work really hard in the morning and then have my whole day like it was just this lovely experience. However, back when I went remote in 2015 there wasn't a lot of resources out there so there there was definitely like some unhealthy habits that I had in the beginning that led to burnout that led to, you know, being on zoom calls all day, you know, all of these unhealthy habits that I'm sure honestly, you're probably familiar with as well. So I started researching and started figuring things out. And I was experimenting constantly on my own workday. Um, and people started noticing it, they started asking me, hey, can you consult for our company? Hey, can you help with this? Um, so in 2018, I formed my company remote work prep on the side while I was working my head of product position. Um, it was supposed to just be for fun. It was supposed to just be people are asking me for this service. I'm going to go ahead and provide it. Um, I love the topic, so why not? Um, and then so we did well for a couple of years. And then in 2020, we just exploded. <laughs> Obviously, we did not see the pandemic happening. Everyone going remote overnight. Um, it was a crazy time. And of course, um, I couldn't keep up with all the incoming requests. So I was trying to figure out how do I help all these people? Um, while I'm one person and only have so, so much time in the day. So I started sharing online. I started first with Twitter, um, and then I, I started a newsletter called Remotely Interesting. We have a course called Mastering Remote Leadership, and I am a huge introvert, so it's very hard for me to like share publicly. I honestly wasn't on socials at all um, before 2020, um, but it's been a wonderful experience because instead of of seeing it as, hey, I'm talking publicly and this is very scary. It was more so about, hey, I'm finally getting to help people at scale. And that's been a wonderful journey for me. So yeah, I think that gives you a basic background. Um, please feel free to ask any question you want. I don't see any question as stupid or any of that. So um, yeah, yeah, I'd love to help you all um, in your remote work journey. Thank you, Marissa. It's really great you've been able to give us the time today. And um, just to kind of get the ball rolling, I'd like people to be kind of thinking about questions while we're, we're kicking off. But I think for me, um, I think a, a theme I've seen in your blogs is about we've all learnt remote working or our first experience has been during a pandemic, and that's not the same as doing it as a conscious choice. And I wondered if you could speak about that contrast a wee bit. So the difference between kind of just having to do it or the difference between making a more kind of a free choice to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So the way I define remote work is giving agency to the individual. So the individual has the option to choose where, when, and how they work in a healthy remote work environment. So that's with normal remote. Remote. When it comes to pandemic remote, those options are much more limited. Like you can't just work wherever you want. You can't choose a co-working space or working from the office sometimes or working from a park or, you know, traveling like a nomad. You don't have those options anymore. So pandemic remote is extremely 
extremely limited. And I don't think a lot of people realize it because a lot of people went remote during a pandemic. They went remote and this is the only thing they've experienced is this limiting options. Um, so my point with you know communicating this across to people that pandemic remote is not normal remote is to open their eyes to these other possibilities of, hey, you can work in the morning, then you could have time with your family in the afternoon and then come back to work in the evening or if you're a night owl, you can have your whole morning to yourself or like sleep in until 12 and then start working. Um, and you can work from other places. You can travel. You can move to different places. If you're stuck in a city that you've been in for a while just because the jobs are there, you can choose to move to a place that makes you happy because your job will come with you. So there's a lot of different um, options that just open up when you switch to normal remote instead of pandemic remote. Yeah, that's a great point because I think, you know, a lot of us are still like making sense of it and, and thinking what the longer term benefits could be. You were talking just there about the kind of, I guess, the rhythm of the day and like whether people are morning people and so on. And that's that I think is an interesting one, because I guess in organizations, people often think of the kind of coordination problem of how do you make sure people are available for the team? And, you know, there's enough crossover. I wonder if you had any thoughts on that at all. Absolutely, absolutely. So one of the things that comes with remote work is that you get to work with people all over the world. And the best part of that is like the diversity, the differences in thought, the like cool people you get to meet that you never would have. On the other hand, there's time zones. And so you're never really going to have that lineup that you did when you were in the office where everybody's in the office from nine to five. And that's just the the norm. Um, so what you learn there is that you have to switch to asynchronous work instead of relying on synchronous work. And synchronous work is things you're all familiar with and something you probably rely on by default. These are things like meetings. These are things like emails where you expect an immediate response. Um, asynchronous work is more of, um, oh, hey, you put this resource here and the person who is receiving this resource can read it in their own time. They can brainstorm asynchronously where they like jot down their thoughts in a document and then you come in later and jot your own thoughts and it goes back and forth. Um, so switching to async first and async first mentality is super important. And the way I go about teaching people how to do that is thinking about the benefits of synchronous versus asynchronous. So synchronous work is fantastic for relationship building and for speed so if the primary purpose of what you're doing is relationship building or speed absolutely use a synchronous avenue you know hop on a zoom call do whatever you need to however if it's all about like thinking deeply or brainstorming or just having that time because when we're synchronous like i'm answering questions off the top of my head right now however if i took those questions back and in my own time thought about them you know edited my answers they're going to come out a lot better <laughs> so you end up with better ideas when you end up doing it in an asynchronous fashion and i have a whole article on this that i'm happy to link um, but that's really how you get started with switching to an async first mentality is thinking is my primary goal speed or relationship building go synchronous if it's not it's most likely should be async great and i think in your article there's some great points there about that front loading communication about writing really clearly and mm -hmm. i think i guess that's one big challenge because i think those of us who've done a lot of office-based work you can kind of get away with a short email because yeah. you're like well if I write a cryptic email to Maddie, she could <laughs> stick her head over the screen and say, what are you talking about? Whereas <laughs> in an async environment, that becomes a big blocker because she's then got to wait until um, she can ask me on chat what the email was about. So yeah. and that is a kind of, that's quite a tricky skill, I think, because we're often used to just trying to write things really quickly and then not really giving all the context. Yeah, yeah. So my company offers fractional head of remote services. So I've gone into dozens of companies and helped them switch to an async first mentality. And what happens is that people are very, very used to how they did things in the office. They've been doing it for years or even decades. So of course. Um, so when we're switching to an async first mentality, it has to come from these practices. So I created the work forward approach, which has eight principles in order to help you on your journey to, you know, switching to async. And one of those is all about 
you have to think about work differently. So typically we think about it in a one, two, three order. Like if we're um, cooking a recipe, we'll think, oh, we have to add this, then we have to add this and it go in step that order. That's how you did things in the office versus when you're doing things async first, you have to think about things happening in parallel because if one thing gets stuck here, you need to move on to another thread so that you don't just remain in this um, stuck zone. Um, so instead of thinking, oh, I have to do it in one, two, three order, I can think, oh, can I boil the water for the side dish while I'm, you know, putting to the, the, together the ingredients for the main dish. And it's switching that thought pattern and it takes some time, but it actually makes your work go faster if you do it right. Um, so I'm a huge proponent for racing first. Great. Um, I wonder if anyone um, who's on chat has got any thoughts or reflections on async before we move the topic to a different area. We've actually had a bit uh, a comment in the chat from Samantha around yes. uh, agile as mm -hmm. opposed to remote and the way that it sounds like Marissa's talking about it, it sounds a bit more what we would call agile. But Samantha, do you want to give us a bit more about that? Yeah, I, I suppose my take is that in using the word remote, I think in the UK in the last two years, it's been very limited to an understanding of being in a physical place. Um, uh, and not about the choice of changing how you work rather than where you work. And I think it's really interesting conversation. Some of this will be in our gift and some of it won't. We're all from different places, obviously. I think one of the questions I would have is companies can sometimes make those choices, but you might be driven by the clients that you have or the, the external parties you have to work with and, and that may not work for them. So that, that's where my mind is going at the moment. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's two parts to this. So one part is that we're using one term to talk about every kind of work type that's like future of work related. And I have an article going out about this about um, specifically for hybrid work because the term hybrid is being used to cover a large amount of, um, you know, work styles as well. That's a problem. And it's honestly just because we're early. Um, it happened overnight and that doesn't tend to happen for a lot of new things. So I knew that it was going to be a trend back in 2015 when only like 4% were working, but then two years, uh, or five years later, it was 50% of the world working remotely. So we still have to play some catch up there in terms of terminology. So you'll see things like async first, you'll see things like globally distributed. Those kind of words help you get a better sense of what the company is actually going for in their remote work style. And then in terms of what you're talking about, where you have clients, I mean, I definitely relate to that. So um, in my head of product position that I was working at before I went full time on my company, we were consulting with tech clients. Um, so I was head of product for a company that had, you know, dozens of tech clients. Um, and then now, even with remote work prep, like I am a fractional head of remote for, again, many, many companies. And the thing is that... A lot of the times their practices are behind. They're trying to replicate the office environment and that tends to lead to things like burnout. It tends to lead to things like hating remote work because they don't know what's possible with it. Um, so actually introducing these habits to them tends to give you more clout and they tend to trust you more because you're bringing in healthier habits to them. So I go about it in the way of asking questions. So I ask them like, what isn't working for you? And then I target those areas first before guiding them towards any other areas. So um, that's that's kind of what I would recommend is just seeing what they're having trouble with and then trying to introduce new practices there because it's much easier to create change around things that they don't like. Great, thank you. Um, we've got a great question from Chris, which I guess is about participation. And I wonder, Chris, if you want to elucidate that a wee bit because I think it's a really interesting one in the context of async. Yeah. I'm going to ask a question about remote and async whilst I'm sitting in our brand new massive London office. So <laughs> I'm, I'm remote in that my... You can whisper that, your question if you want, Chris. <laughs> no, it's okay. My, my boss is sitting next to me, so it uh, should keep me in check. Um, yeah, I think async has been really interesting. Um, and I find it interesting because so few decisions are actually taken in rooms in the voluntary sector, but there's so much resistance to finding ways for those who are not there on the day at the time to actually be meaningfully involved. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's more of an observation. And I guess the question which I then added was, um, 
how can nonprofits adopt async whilst guarding against overwork? Because certainly in the pandemic, um, nonprofits and indeed uh, other businesses have seen people doing more hours at unusual times to the with a, with a negative impact on well-being. And there is a tendency to think that async means you can do more at times that you shouldn't be working. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so there's a couple different things here. So um, when it comes to async, um, the thing is that it actually should encourage you to do it during times that are best for you because you can do it in your own time and you don't have to be synchronous with other people's time zones. You can do it in healthy work hours versus if you were synchronous all the time, you would have to do it in like, oh, you know, 10 p.m. at night because this time zone is 8 a.m. and, you know, so on and so forth. So it should encourage you to do it in healthier work hours. The other thing is that you're absolutely right. A lot of people have been overworking. It's a huge problem. And it comes from the fact that when you're in the office, people see that you're working. You wouldn't show up at like 12 p.m., you know, and just roll in and start your work because other people would judge you. Um, when we're online, we're like, oh, people aren't seeing me. They don't know that I'm working. They don't know that I like, I, I, I want to continue working remotely because it gives me this freedom. Um, so they tend to overwork, be overly available, overly synchronous, like available to respond to Slack messages right away instead of like having their deep work. And this ends up with burnout, obviously. <laughs> um, I believe that working remotely allows you to work during the hours that you work best in. It gives you less interruptions. It has a lot of um, it has a lot of benefits that end up making your work better. So I think you should actually be working less rather than working more because you're doing more with the hours that you're given. So I'm a big proponent of creating firm boundaries. So one of the things that I go through with some of my coaching clients is like, hey, you used to have this commute. You commuted to work and then you were like, okay, I am you know, working, I am, I'm, I'm at work, I'm in work mode, great. What is your commute now? It shouldn't be something you hate. So that should be the benefit and the perk here. Um, so it should be something you like. Um, so this could be like a walk around the block and then you get started or you have like a, a morning routine that stacks things up. Um, and then in the evening, how do you disconnect? Like what is your firm boundary there? So I talk about creating an end of work day. So in the office, your end of work day was 5 p.m. And then you like commuted home or whatever. Now, what is it? So for me, what I do, is I take a hybrid approach. So there's two ways you can do it. You can set a time like you did in the office, then great, you know, set those firm boundaries for it. Or you can do a task-based approach where you set a specific number of tasks you wanna complete, and then that's your end of work day. Or you can take a hybrid approach. Like me, I set three tasks that I wanna complete that day or by 4 p.m. So whichever hits first, that's my end of work day. And a lot of people go into working from home without that clear definition of done. They don't see it as 5 p.m. They don't see it as those specific tasks. So they just keep working because they're never gonna feel like they're done with work because there's always more to do. So setting that clear definition of done is incredibly important. Great, that's really helpful. I'm gonna propose a little quick straw poll now around the the Zoom room. I wonder if people who are not commuting at the moment, have, are they doing anything like a commute instead, even once or twice a week? Or are we kind of getting straight online? It's a, a really interesting question, I think, because it for me personally, that felt like a great kind of transition time of a shift from a home mindset to a work mindset. So you could fire an answer in chat or I'm not going to get everyone to shout out, but a lot of people straight on. So some people doing dog walks, nothing. It is tricky because I feel like part of what's going on, I guess, is, you know, it means you can be in work really quickly. So I think there's um, Nick Bloom at Stanford did some research recently, and it was like how long grooming takes for going to your office versus just switching on at home. It's like half the time because you can just jump straight straight online. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's inter interesting from Samantha, I guess, you know, your commute was a source of stress and frustration and you like the fact that you can now kind of get stuck in straight away. 
Yeah, the commute always felt like a waste of time for me. I would be sitting there in traffic getting upset before I even started my work. Um, and then that would like seep into my work. And yeah, I just hated the commute always. So I was very happy about getting rid of it as well. Yeah. And in your experience, Marissa, you're talking about creating boundaries there. And do you find that's a kind of co-creating process or is that one where you're working with senior leadership? Because I guess one of the big, big questions with evolving work is, you know, is that a, an inclusive process or is it one where organizations are telling people the plan? I, I think it depends. Um, so on one hand, I work with organizations, you know, as their fractional head of remote, and we make sure that there's processes in place that make sure that everyone isn't in meetings all day. So that's typically the first thing we do is try to cut, you know, all their meetings in half because most of them aren't needed. Um, so on that level, it should be company, but on a personal level, level, if you're a, a manager, you have a huge influence on your team. Um, so setting specific days, like for me, Wednesdays and Fridays are meeting days. Um, and that's for the, my rest of my team as well. Like that allows them to have deep work days at least three days per week. Um, so you have a huge influence there. If you're an IC, it becomes a little bit more difficult if you don't have that influence. So working with your manager to be like, hey, I really want to complete these tasks that you're assigning me. However, I have eight meetings today. <laughs> like, where am I supposed to fit in this deep work? The 15 minutes in between meetings just doesn't work for creating this, you know, huge proposal. And bringing, bringing that to your boss and asking questions instead of coming at it like, I can't do this <laughs> um, uh, is a really great way to start setting those boundaries with other people who do have those influence. So it really depends on what role you're in um, and what exactly you're talking about building boundaries around. Yeah. Great. Um, Chris may be offline now, but made a good point about it's the switch to the end of day, like switching off work is often more important than how you get going. Um, well, and I think it's both. So I think one, when you, if you start the day and as soon as you wake up, you're in work mode, that can sometimes be unhealthy because you end up spending all day in work mode, or you end up spending more time than you would have because instead of creating a firm end of day boundary where you're like, I'm going to finish early because I started as soon as I woke up, you're just continuing working. So it's like your commute hours get transitioned into work hours and, you know, you become burned out, but but yeah, I think that there's there's specific cases where as long as you create that firm end of day boundary, you can you know start immediately in the morning. Yeah. Cool. Um, I know you mentioned Marissa that hybrid is a very broad term that people are using in all kinds of different ways. But um, I wondered if people in the room, if their organisations are exploring that and some of the implications of it. I think one topic I've seen coming up a lot recently is that question of where the organizations try and coordinate days. So that could be a kind of a few times a quarter kind of thing, or are people nominating particular days of the week? Because I guess with an office, you've got that paradox of the reason you go there is to see other members of your team. But if you all come in one day, you need to have a very big office. Um, so that's the challenge, I guess. <laughs> so I wondered if people in chat wanted to signal what, you know, what kind of things they're seeing in their organizations. Yeah, and if you're hybrid, go ahead and just, I think you're on video, go ahead and raise your hand so I can see. Just one, two, three. We're a bit okay, hybrid. So I'm going to raise my hand slightly to say <laughs> there's some face to face happening, but on a reasonably limited basis at the minute. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll be honest, I'm not a huge fan of hybrid. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't love it. Um, I actually have a big article coming out on why I don't love it <laughs> and yeah. uh, what I think some of the red flags are. Um, because what I see happening right now is that people are going into it being like, okay, so we'll go hybrid, you know, get the best of both worlds. That's not usually the case. Um, and, and the thing is like this hybrid work isn't new. Like it's been around for a long time right now. And big companies like Yahoo have tried and failed at it in the past. And it ends up with everybody going back to it in the office because they can't solve for these four red flags. And what I'm talking about here is that when you're going hybrid, there's either one, the de decision maker is in person. 
So the person making the decisions for remote team members is in person, they aren't affected by the decisions and it ends up degrading the entire remote experience. Um, two, it ends up reducing remote work benefits. So like we talked about, Remote work is all about giving agency to the individual over where, when, and how they work. Um, with hybrid, that immediately takes away the location independence because they have to live directly next to the office, and it takes away a bunch of the other steps as well. It also makes them very disgruntled because they have to go from like working their way while they're remote for, let's say, two days a week, and then having to like switch into office way, which is a one-size-fits-all approach when they're in office. Um, and then there's three unequal opportunities. So managers who are in person will end up giving their opportunity opportunities to the people they go out with lunch and, you know, see every day versus seeing the invisible work of remote workers. And then four, you end up with the problem that's going viral on social media right now where you have people going into the office and having to do that commute just to spend all day on Zoom calls. So it ends up being like, why am I even here? So it's less intentional. Um, so we have seen uh, companies in the past, and this is what my whole article is about, is like, just learn from the mistakes so you don't repeat the same thing. Um, we have seen companies in the past actually do hybrid right, where it's not forced hybrid, where you're forced to come in certain days of the week. Instead, it's up to the individual so that you're increasing the optionality. Um, which tends to do best with remote work. They do it in a remote first fashion where instead of like defaulting to synchronous activities because they're in person and they can go back to those bad habits, they do a remote first fashion where everything is documented and so on and so forth. There's a bunch of different things. However, what you see is that the companies that have you know, done everything right when it came to hybrid, within a couple of years, they went fully remote, like 100% remote because what happens is that that office, um, like the popularity of the office tends to taper over time as people get more used to remote work, as people adapt to new habits and so on. Um, so uh, companies like Buffer and Basecamp both had offices in the beginning and then ended up getting rid of them entirely um, because of that. So I think it depends. I think that with hybrid right now, if you are firmly for in office or formally, firmly for remote, just choose one. It's gonna be the best option. It's the most formed option. However, if you're set on hybrid, just know about those red flags and know about you know the past history of what hybrid has um, worked and what hasn't and go into it with that knowledge. Thank you, really interesting. And I'm just seeing in the, the comments there, a few people have tipped in that they're trying out a few days. I wonder if anybody who's been trying out a few days wanted to say how that's been going. Chris? Uh, yeah, so we have, we've asked people to be in two days a week uh, pro rata for, for full time. And uh, we're trying to have a consistent approach across London, Glasgow and um, Cardiff offices. And um, in London and Glasgow, they're both brand new offices. So we're not going back. We're going to something completely new and different, which has been a real opportunity, but also to an extent a challenge. And I think a number of those flags I have seen already um i think i put a couple of things in the chat there um something which is vexing me is is how you bring together people who are in the room enjoying the benefits of collaboration with people who are in other offices so if we decide that everyone from a team or division that is split across three offices is going to be in on a tuesday and we have a team meeting and 15 people are in a room together in london having fun and four people are in a room in Glasgow and two people are in a room in Cardiff, the quality of interaction drastically drops because you don't get everyone's nonverbal communication. You don't get the value of people commenting in chat uh, and all those other things. But if the decision makers in the room in London, that's the way it goes. Um, and I've certainly seen and found personally the adjustment back to offices. Um, you see, I am sporting a pair of noise counselling headphones. Um, they are a necessity and also arguably a culture killer. So I'm kind of living Bruce Daisley and Marissa's stuff on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, trying to apply the best of Agile in prototyping and learning from it. Yeah. 
highly recommend reading that article. It should be out this week um, and it should give you some ideas on how to like skip a couple steps ahead instead of just sitting there and, you know, yeah. all the all the red flags. Yeah. And that's such a kind of constructive approach, mostly of that kind of point of looking for mistakes from others, because that gives you a kind of, you can avoid that kind of pitfall. Because I guess the reality is we're all still in very much in a learning phase, so there's not a kind of obvious default to, to jump to. So yeah, the pitfalls are good ones to look for. Yeah, it's just like with learning anything, like learning from people who are one or two steps ahead of you is always the best place to be rather than learning from people who you know haven't done it before or who are like a hundred steps ahead of you and don't even remember what it was like to be in your position. Yeah, that was one thing we find in the early phase of the pandemic was if you went and looked for resources on good remote work, they were from organizations who'd made that their mission over some time. So mm -hmm. they're quite hard to implement in a kind of yep. crisis situation for smaller organizations. So, yeah. yeah, a big one with that is GitLab has a fantastic remote culture, has fantastic documentation. They have this whole handbook that's like hundreds and hundreds of pages long. I show it to some of my clients and they're like, whoa, <laughs> way too much. <laughs> Let's start at like, you know, level zero and work up from there. So yeah, I absolutely understand that, that perspective. <laughs> Cool. Um, any other questions around the room? Um, we're happy to move the topic on, but I want to make sure that if you've got a, a question you've been wondering about or something you wanted to share, that everyone's free to do that if they want to. Samantha's popped another question in. So yeah, a lot of work isn't at a desk. And so it's do you, by that to mean being out and about with people you're working with? Or? Yeah, so I, it's not so much a question, I just I think just being mindful that uh, for some of us, particularly in not for profits, you're working with um, colleagues who are practitioners, they might be social workers, they might be all sorts of professionals who are in schools, for example, it could be all sorts of different settings that you're working with where actually it's it's not appropriate to that relationship building work that you're doing or the support that you're offering that is desk-based. And so for us, we have a multitude of different ways and people that we work with. So some of this is in our gift, I guess, and it's about adapting desk work, but some of that's more challenging. And we're about to embark on our hybrid modeling that we're just gonna be testing. We've just asked everybody to be patient, share what they're learning, and we'll yep. find a way forward, right? But we can't just make assumptions about the what actually are the easier things, I think, in terms of what can you ably do in a remote setting when you've got a computer. Um, <laughs> there are more fundamental things that you need to do with relationship building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely agree. Yeah, and remote work is definitely not for everyone. I don't think, I'm not a proponent for remote work being the only option for work. I'm a proponent for there to be multiple options. So for people who work best in office, great. They should absolutely be in the office. Um, for people who have to take a hybrid approach because, you know, like what you're saying, they have to do some things in person. Absolutely. Like they have to. Um, the thing is to remember that there shouldn't be a one size fits all. I feel like for the past, you know, a hundred years, we've tried to fit, you know, a one size fits all approach for everyone's work and work is expanding. We're becoming more towards knowledge work instead of more physical work. And we should be adapting to that and allowing people to have multiple options so that they can fit their work. And instead of work, instead of life revolving around work, work should revolve around life. So that's what I'm, I'm pushing for. Okay, thank you. Um, Ross, did you have a hand up a second ago? Yeah, no, I mean, it was it was a reflection, actually, of a conversation I had some uh, recently with someone, I think probably lots of people find themselves in this position, where she was telling me, I've got a work meeting, but it's okay because it's just a work meeting where I listen and I don't need to say anything. <laughs> I just wonder like, <laughs> how many of those meetings are we having, not just in the third sector, but public sector and private Too sector many. as well, where it's like, that. that's not a meeting. Right. Like, I mean, that's a webinar at best. I don't yeah. know what that is. To be fair. Oh, it's an email, but it's on a Zoom call now. I don't know what that is, but I don't know if you've got any reflections on that, but sort of how we avoid that or, yeah, no. Yeah, I, those, those meetings annoy me so much. I feel like they're a waste of time. So when it comes to information sharing, information sharing is best done through async method, methods. So this could be a recorded video. This could be text. This could be, you know, a variety of different ways. And I have something called, um, 
uh, this little cycle that I have for um, making sure you're not repeating yourself, but you are also sharing in a way that's best done virtually. Um, so I'll find that article in a second. But when it comes to information sharing, async is best because when we're in like something like this, people learn differently, people hear differently. And if they aren't required to pay attention and be an active participant, they're most likely not receiving that information the way that you think they are. Um, so yes, I think those meetings should absolutely go away <laughs> and there's far too many of them. I think, sorry, it's Audrey's got a really good point in the in the chat about uh, this is not something I've heard before, Audrey, so that's kind of why I've picked up on it. Um, do you want to just give us a bit more information about that? Um, yeah, hi. Well, we, we have been uh, trialing a sort of voluntary time in the office and we do try to encourage people uh, to come in maybe once a week, once a fortnight, but it is voluntary. But um, in some of the group sessions with staff, whether they've been Zoom or whatever, um, yeah, there's been a feeling that um, those that come in are getting more work, basically getting the stuff that's faced in the office where people that choose to sit at home voluntarily right now are perhaps dipping out of certain aspects of work and that burden's carried by the people who are coming into the office. Um, and it did come up in another a group session I was in with somebody else. So I just wondered what Marissa's view, if that is common or um, tactics round about that. Interesting. Audrey, would you mind giving me an example? Um, I think the example um, that was given is we're a charity. Um, we're a large independent advice centre. So I think the example given was simply if uh, clients presented at the front door face to face when actually officially we're not technically open for that. That was one example. And just the idea of um, things that need done round about the office that perhaps if you're not in, you're never encountering, whether that's maintaining a, I don't know, joining together in a clean desk policy. Um, that sounds a bit spurious, but there was a couple of examples that just those that perhaps stay at home, it was a suggestion they're hiding at home, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. So I don't agree with their hiding at home, but I do agree that there are differences when you're in office versus remote. And it goes both ways because there are benefits to being in office, like we talked about where the people in office are most likely getting opportunities that the people remotely are not getting because they're having more hidden work. Um, so when it comes to this, I would recommend looking at Atlassian. Atlassian acquired a company called Trello, which was fully remote. This, this happened pre-pandemic, all of this. Um, Trello was fully remote and they had to integrate into a culture that was not fully remote and they brought some of the the remote practices and they brought some of the office habits and they became kind of like this hybrid company and this is one of the few companies that I've seen that has stayed hybrid, although there has been major problems involved with it, but one of the things that they talked about multiple times is that in order to in order to maintain the relationships between those working in person and those working remotely is that you had to realize that it was never going to be equal. Like that was just not going to happen. It's impossible to make it happen because working in person and working remotely is just two separate things. So there are going to be benefits on both sides and there are going to be, you know, weaknesses on both sides. Like you have to do some things different. Um, but it's important to realize that that's just going to happen and there's no way to make it equal like that. Um, so yeah, it's not an answer I'm, I'm sure you like want to hear, but um, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, yeah, no, no, it's, it's fine, Marissa. I, th I think we would just be encouraging um, some sort of mixed approach for everybody. And I'm not sure that we will, because we're client centered, I'm not sure, unless it was people like myself, maybe in management, I don't, I mean, it, it would be probably impossible to remain at home five days. So I, th I think sort of mixed approach. But um, I'm loving the your your work today and jotting down loads. Um, I will be carefully researching async I think um yeah it's a different way of thinking it because I am that person that would send somebody something at 3 a.m because I happen to be doing it I'm not expecting them to read it or answer it or anything so yeah thank you very much for that approach Marissa
Yeah, so glad to hear it, Audrey. Uh, and for that, that just requires a responsiveness policy. So if people see something from their manager and they're like, oh, I have to respond right away because I'm going to be in trouble if I don't. Um, whereas if they have a firm responsiveness policy within the company that says, hey, even if you receive this and you see it, you don't have to respond right away. Um, typically with my companies, we talk about a 24 hour response period for a typical message, not like urgent messages. There's different protocols for those, but for a typical message, uh, 24 hours within your own working hours, not within their working hours. Um, so that should help with that. Um, I'm going to take a question from T Ramsey in a second because they've had a, a wee hand up. But Hi. if I may, a wee a quick observation for will be one on the kind of sending at 3 a.m. is I would say scheduled send is your friend. And that's something where a colleague that I work with, the end of our weeks don't exactly line up. So we scheduled send a lot. So it basically means as I think of something, I can send it their way, but I know it's not going to reach their inbox until their next working time. And we find that's been really, really productive because it means um, you don't lose stuff because you don't forget to do it, but equally it, you're not overwhelming people at difficult times for them. The other quick thought I had, Audrey, was I guess part of your example there was about if you're on the premises, you're getting a lot of ad hoc queries that are not people at home are not exposed to. And I wonder if maybe part of that is you can then find other pieces of work you could steer towards your remote colleagues. You know, if you're finding that somebody in the office is spending about an hour a day on ad hoc stuff, maybe there's some other things they could put into a pipeline for other team members to pick up. I would talk to the remote colleagues as well because they're honestly probably doing some hidden tasks that you're not yeah. necessarily seeing or being made aware of just because it's done in their own time in their own space. Um, and then when it comes to scheduled send, be very, very careful with that. It can be very helpful if your team members are working the same hours as you and if they're mm -hmm. in the same time zone. However, we usually try to rely on policies over scheduled send because mm -hmm. what happens is you're sent scheduling them more in your own time zone or you have to be aware of all the multiple time zones and working hours because like we talked about it might not be they might not work nine to five they might work you know 12 to eight or whatever so it's better to have policies and expectations in place where they have firm virtual boundaries which means they're not actually receiving said notifications when they're when they're being sent outside of working hours and um, two they know that they will not be in trouble if they do not respond right away so with that responsiveness policy so just keep that in mind with those Thanks for your good points. So T Ramsey, we've kept you waiting. Um, thank you for okay. being patient. Would you like to share your question? I'm going to keep my camera off because I, no I know that it's been recorded. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, thanks for um, having me on here today. I am actually from the public sector. And so um, I realise that I'm 100% outnumbered. So, um, <laughs> but the thing is, <laughs> <laughs> I might not be, but I was intrigued by it when I saw remote working because, let's face it, it's the biggest um, a, a conversation going around at the moment. So we are, I'm a community worker, so I am working with lots of organisations and groups. And since we, when we first started, we went into emergency response for the pandemic, we thought, no, how community worker working from home and in front of the laptop that's not possible our job's done you know and then over the last couple of years we've totally restructured we we're working online we're delivering adult learning classes we're working with community groups i would probably say that i'm working more effectively than i've ever worked um, in a long long time and i quite like it although the isolation part is a struggle and I do miss seeing my colleagues, but, but now we're getting out when we want to and managing our time with that as well. So it's all good. But now we're moving into hybrid working and mixed working. So we're being asked now to go in at least when the buildings become available and they're ready uh, because being local authority, they have got to be completely 100% up to scratch. So this one to two days a week was, uh, is, is going to be good. But now we're all now thinking, how are we going to be doing that in there? You know, we're used to working the way we are. So um, I suppose I, I'm probably not getting any response here. It's just nice to hear how the, everyone's kind of going through the same thing and that we're still learning in a big massive way, how are we going to work effectively? But I'm mostly interested because I've got to take questions, not from this particular thing, but 
we've been asked to put questions and concerns forward for working in the offices. And I think one of the things for me is that, you know, it, it is that work-life balance now. And But community work, we're reaching more people than we've ever reached because when we have a community meeting now for an organisation, we we can get up to 25 different local organisations come into one meeting and we'll be lucky if we ever got three or four. So we've got to say we need to hang on to that mix and not lose. I'm sorry, Marissa, you've been doing this for a long time, but we're all we're all COVID babies, you know. So <laughs> that's when that started. And, and I wouldn't want to lose it. I don't know what other people think. But I want I wouldn't want to lose that online approach, that mixed approach, because uh, it, it, I, I could drive for an hour in the winter, in the rain and the snow to go to a meeting for two hours on an evening and not get home. And now I can sit in my cosy house, attend a meeting, do my job. And when I switch off, I just go get my Horlicks or red <laughs> wine. <laughs> Usually exactly. red wine. Yeah, there's absolutely an accessibility thing happening here. So um, so one of the things that I did, so you save time from not commuting and you save mental energy as well as like emotional energy because you're not in the office all day, especially for people like me who are introverts. And one of the things that I did with that extra time and energy is I ran for local office. So I ran for local office. I landed a locally elected seat. So now I'm an official district member. And one of the things we saw is that when we went, uh, you know, like pandemic started and we had to start taking these meetings, um, the community meetings that you're talking about remotely, all of a sudden attendance shot up. Yeah. And um, that's because like there's this accessibility part, like it, you, they can take that call from wherever they are. They don't have to worry about, oh, I have to be there by X time and I have to pick up my kids around then and who's going to watch my kids in order for me to go to this meeting. Like there's so many pieces to that, as well as like there's also like disability accessibility as well. Um, I know a lot of people who have you know, invisible illnesses that would keep them on like bed rest or, you know, like they'd, they wouldn't be able to be in the office environment and think clearly. Um, and now they can, and now they're getting promoted much faster and their work is getting recognized much more because they have an alternative option. Um, so again, I think that the one size fits all approach just doesn't work for a lot of people. And we're able to get more accessibility and more diversity and thought through providing more options, yeah. Yeah, I like that, more options, uh, definitely. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and I guess that is a really interesting lens to approach it with, is to think about what will we be missing that we want to get back when we adopt a new style, but then also what do we not want to lose that we've tried in pandemic yeah. times? And I, One of the things I would encourage people to think about, because I know, uh, Ramsey, you brought up isolation and feeling kind of like that loneliness. One of the things that I would encourage you to rethink is what you get from your job. I think we've placed a lot of responsibility on our job to provide us with, in America, that's things like healthcare and lots of different benefits our government doesn't provide, but also like friendship. We've relied on school and work to provide those relationships and not really learning how to build those relationships ourselves. And what that means is that HR is choosing who our friends are, not us. So you might be friends with people just because it was convenient <laughs> instead of necessarily like you share the same values, you, you like each other, like that kind of thing. Um, so learning how to build those relationships for yourself. I, I feel like, I actually feel like I have more of a community now than I work, that I work fully remotely than I did before because those relationships I've built are much deeper and, um, you know, have a firmer foundation. So just something to think about. Great. Um, we have an interesting question from Neve, who's asking, Marissa, if you're seeing working hours reducing as organizations are working more productively when people are working remotely. Absolutely. And I, I firmly believe that that should happen because, um, like I said, you are working hours that are more conducive to your style of work um, and you're able to do it in an environment that's solely optimized for you. 
Um, so I will say like I used to work 12 hour work days when I was in person. I tend to work around six hour work days now and I get way more done. I'm way more successful now than I was when I was doing those 12 hour work days. And I have a fuller life. And I think that feeds back into my work because I am so happy with the way things are. And like I, I'm able to decompress and not burn myself out because I was constantly in a burnout cycle when I was, you know, nonstop working. So absolutely, we are seeing um, less hours being worked, but more quality work getting done. Yeah. Um, interesting one from Elizabeth is asking about with Zoom meetings, you don't tend to get the conversations on the margins. And that's something I've experienced myself actually on a, a board I'm part of when we did in-person board meetings would be social time as well. So we got to know each other in a more holistic way. Um, and with Zoom, it, that always feels quite difficult to do, you know, because however you say, well, let's all make a cup of tea or whatever it might be, doesn't feel quite the same. I wonder if you have any thoughts on that one. Yeah. So Synchronous activities, again, are for relationship building and for speed. So absolutely for Zoom calls, if it's if you're doing something that's more relationship building and you want to connect, um, I would recommend keeping a smaller group so that people are able to talk. When you have a larger group, it tends to be the people who are more extroverted or you know are willing to speak over someone else because you run the risk of that with Zoom. Um, also, there's new tools and I'm so bad with names, so I'm going to have to look this up. But basically, uh, basically what you want to do is not just use tools that replicate the office environment. Zoom and Slack would both be examples of this, but tools that um, take advantage of the digital world. So the digital world has been very conducive for like video games and like that kind of element. So if you push that into um, like meeting software and you have those together, it ends up bringing a whole new dimension to it. So one of the ones that I'm talking about, and I'm forgetting the name, but I will Google it in just a second, um, is basically like you're a little avatar that runs around on the screen and you can go in and um, play games with other people like uh, Hangman and that kind of thing. And there's multiple pods around. So if you have a larger group, you can like be in a, a three person pod over here and a three person pod over there. And as you move your avatar closer, you start to hear them louder and louder like you would if you were you know, walking up to a group in person. Um, so it kind of replicates certain things, but then also you know, makes um, the most of the virtual environment. So I recommend trying out different tools like that, which can be a bit more fun and get you out of like the, I have to speak and talk in a certain way on Zoom. <laughs> Great. And Martha, I think, has given a few suggestions of um, platforms they've been trying. Oh, um, good. Hopefully it's one of those, yeah. so I don't have it to. It might well be, yeah. Oh, no, it's not. It's not. Um... OK, right. So Marisa, well, there's another resource that she might look up for us. We're near <laughs> the end of the allotted hour now. So if anybody has any quick last questions, please go for it. I was just going to say, I think Marissa might be meaning Mebo. Um, it's not that, you, but it probably is similar. Very, very yeah. similar. Um, if you want a virtual beer with your colleagues. Um, but also, um, it has question packs. Ah, in yeah. Various spaces. So it's quite good. And they're very good questions. So they're sort of conversation starters, not work related ones. Mm -hmm. So if you want to do sort of team and bonding stuff, it can be quite good for that. Cool. Very nice. Great. Um, okay. Um, Audrey's asked quite a big question about um, performance managing staff. Um, so it's about, so I guess your question Sorry, is maybe question. about resources to kind of support staff to work well if um, you've got concerns about how they're working at home. Is that right? Yeah, so I guess I'm, I'm listening to you guys today and I'm grabbing that you all fall into the category of your hard workers and if anything, you enjoy working at home, you can be disciplined, etc. cetera. But um, uh, the team I lead is 46 people and they're not all that type of worker. Um, and obviously COVID was a shock and it's been good in many ways, but there were people who went home at COVID and I'm sure watched the film on film five or film four every afternoon that that you know so for some people that perhaps being in the office and their line manager and their colleagues 
are what drive them to produce what they need to do without that those rails at home is is that happening a lot and what's the tactic for that and I should say I noticed Pamela Deans is on this today and somebody gave an example of great remote working and getting to meetings Pamela Deans um, is at the other end of Scotland from me and we put together a bid with 26 different agencies and the guys are right there is no way that would have happened if we'd traveled from the Western Isles in fact every local authority in Scotland it just wouldn't happen so things like that has given opportunities but yeah, still my depressing question to end on. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's all good. It's all good. I'll try to answer this fast because I do have something else I have to jump to very soon. So there's a couple points to this. So first is that there needs to be clear expectations. So a lot of times when I talk to people, managers who are experiencing this, it's just that they've expected their workers to kind of just know what they're supposed to be doing instead of having clear, firm expectations and being able to say at the end of the week, yes, I checked all of these off or no, I did not, and having them follow up with that communication. So clear expectations is definitely the start. The second part of this is that it comes down to hiring. So if your hiring practices are the same as they were pre-pandemic in person, then your hiring practices are going to be poor at bringing in the right people who can work effectively remotely. Um, so what I mean by that is that when you're working in person, there's a lot relying on external factors, like how you look, how you present yourself, how you talk, how you, you know, like whether you showed up on time, those factors matter in person. They do not matter when you're working remotely. So what matters when you're working remotely is quality of work. So instead of me trying to interview someone over Zoom, most of the time when I hire people, I don't even see their face. Like I'm hiring them based off of a paid project that I provided them. I've seen their output of work that happened in their own time, in their own space. And I'm saying, oh, wow, that's fantastic. That's exactly what I need. So your hiring practices need to change to update to the type of work that they'll be doing. Um, so yeah, when it comes to poor man performance management, it tends not to be on the individual, like most people think. It tends to be more on expectations, hiring practices, and then on the individual. So make sure those two are covered first. Thanks, Marisa. And I'm aware you need to get to your next thing. So thank you for the time today. And I guess I just acknowledge what Audrey raised there. It's not an easy question. You know, it's not a kind of we'd love it if there was a nice straightforward answer for you. And it's a difficult one to grapple with. But so thanks, Marisa, for um, those really helpful points. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, this will go on our YouTube channel later. And we are meeting at the end of April. We will circulate the link by email and we We'll be talking about green tech and climate impacts of technology towards the end of April. So thanks again, everyone. And I hope you have a good rest of afternoon or morning. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Bye. Thank you you so have much. a lovely day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, John. <laughs> thanks, Marisa. That was really thanks, wonderful. Marisa. Really lots of really useful discussions. So thanks so much. So glad. <laughs> I'll see you. Yeah, thank you. Maddie's off. Oh. Cool. Uh, grand. I wonder, because I know we were going to have a, 